Okay. Um, welcome back to the afternoon session. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, how research on flow visualization started uh, fluid dynamics in superfluid um, I'm way from Florida State University. Um, in this talk, I will focus on discussing our measurement capability in superfluid angle. And uh, essentially, I will skip uh, some of the uh, measurement results. I will focus more on discussing the technique and also some of going. So, our cryogenic lab is located in Tallahassee. Uh, it's essentially inside the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. This is a photo of my current group. Uh, the work I'm going to present was uh, conducted by some previous students, including uh, Jane Gao, um, uh, Brian, and some visiting students like uh, Amiel from uh, Ladix group, and also some existing students like uh, Dr. Bao, Ito Seoki, and uh, um, Hamid. So here is a brief, brief outline of my talk. I will discuss why we're interested in studying fluid flow in superfluid healing, and then I'll discuss uh, the visualization method in healing too. And then in the last part, I will briefly uh, talk about our ongoing work. I think maybe uh, I, I selected a two ongoing work that I think may be uh, interesting to the audience uh, in this conference, especially uh, vortex image in levitated healing drug, which may or may not be related to recent style research. All right, why are we interested in starting hydrodynamic dynamics in uh, cryogenic healing? One of the important reasons is Indeed, cryogenic healing is a very useful fluid material in turbulence research, especially in the so-called high Reynolds number turbulence research. We know that turbulence generated in nature, for instance, those in the air, you know, caused by air flying airplane, or those turbulent flow generated by a large ship in the ocean, they are turbulent. And normally the Reynolds number could be extremely high, like 10 to 8 to 10 to 9. It's <coughs> extremely difficult to generate those highly turbulent flows in the laboratory. For systematic research. With typical fluid material like water or air, you have to use very large and you know, large scale flow facilities to achieve this Reynolds number. With typical wind tunnels, one can hardly get up to 10 to the 6. But on the other hand, liquid helium could be very useful due to uh, its very special property. There are three uh, fluid phases helium 1, the normal liquid phase, classical Nemstokes Stokes uh, fluid. And then the superfluid phase, helium 2 at a low temperature, and also the gases phase. Um, both helium 1 and helium 2 have extremely small kinematic viscosity compared to other conventional uh, fluid material. For instance, compared to air, uh, the kinematic viscosity is about three orders of magnitude small. I think this kind of picture was first proposed by a paper by Latik and, and uh, colleagues. Um, so this means with helium 1 and helium 2, one can easily generate a very high Reynolds number of flows, turbulent flows, even with compact flow facility. Indeed, in our lab, my colleague Steve Vanskyber, he produced a pipe flow, a helium pipe flow with Reynolds number as high as uh, 10 to, uh, 2 times 10 to the already. So that's uh, definitely very useful. Furthermore, I want to mention that um, Cryogenic healing has a critical point which has very low critical pressure. So this means one can easily get around this critical pressure. If you manipulate the temperature pressure around this critical pressure, actually you can tune the fluid density by orders of magnitude. So this is why essentially this healing gas has a wide range of uh, you know, tuning range of the kinematic viscosity. Um, you can probably see that uh, with, some, with some other conventional fluid material, you can also achieve relatively large tuning range. But to do that, actually, you need to uh, compress the fluid material to very high pressure. For instance, for air, you need to compress it to 200 atmosphere pressure, which is very difficult and expensive. Furthermore, there's no way to do flow visualization. So that's another advantage. And this is especially useful in turbulent conduction research. Another reason is, um, uh, we're interested in the very fascinating quantum hydrodynamics in the superfluid phase. So as we know, when liquid helium 4 is cooled below about 0.2.2 K at saturated vapor pressure, it undergoes a phase transition in the superfluid phase. And then phenomenologically, 
there are two fluid components, the superfluid component, which is essentially the condensate, and then the normal component, which is the thermal excitation, the collection of thermal excitations on top of the condensate. The total density is the summation of the two fluid component density. This total density is nearly temperature independent, but the fraction of each component actually depends strongly on temperature. Below about one Kelvin, there is essentially no normal fluid. The fraction drops down to nearly zero. Both fluid components can have independent holes to fill. Normal fluid has no viscosity, no entropy, but uh, superfluid has no viscosity, no entropy. Normal fluid just behaves like a classical fluid, like a water or heat. And then, um, since we have two fluid components, turbulence can actually occur in both fluids. In a superfluid, the turbulence is essentially a tangle of quantized vortices. If you know the position of those vortex lines, in principle, you can calculate the complete velocity field. Um, the turbulence in the normal component is more classical. However, we must remember that the quartz particles can actually scatter off the quantized forces, which can lead to the mutual friction between the two components. And this mutual friction can actually affect the hydrodynamics in both fluids, and this can be significant in some cases. As far as the hydrodynamics is concerned, there are two temperature regions. One is above 1K, when we have both components coexist. In this case, there are two types of flows that we're interested. One is the so-called thermal current flow, which can be generated by a applied heat current. For instance, here, you enclose the channel filled with a superfluid heating. If you turn on heater, then what will happen is that there will be no convection. It's not like you know, in, in classical fluid, air or water. In superfluid, in superfluid heating, the normal fluid will carry the heat and move away from the heat source. And meanwhile, the super component will move in the opposite direction to compensate the fluid mass. And then their velocities are directly controlled by the applied heat flux. This counter flow mode is very, very effective. It actually leads to an apparent thermal conductivity of helium 2 much, much higher than other, any other materials. And this is the reason why helium 2 has been widely utilized as a coolant in many engineering and scientific applications. For instance, at MagLab, we use superfluid helium to cool superconducting magnet. And then, uh, those particle physicists, they use superfluid helium to cool large-scale particle colliders or accelerators. However, it's known that when the relative velocity of the two components exceeds a small critical value, then turbulence sets in in a superfluid component in the form of a random uh, vortex tangle. And thus, quantum turbulence can significantly reduce the heat transfer capability of superfluid helium. So this phenomenon has been started for decades, but even up now, um, there are still open questions. For instance, um, when both fluid becomes turbulent in counter flow, we know that there is a mutual friction which acts at all length scales. So that means dissipation actually occurs at all length scales. This is completely different from classical turbulence in water, where dissipation only occurs below a small scale called a commodore scale. So you would expect to see new <coughs> characteristic of this type of turbulence, as you know, Victor already explained in his talk. But the challenge in there is many tools developed for classical turbulent flow research are not applicable. For instance, those pressure sensors and uh, temperature sensors, because both fluid component can <coughs> contribute to the sensor response. So it's hard to interpret the measurement result. We need new tools, especially for visualization tools. Another type of flow is the so-called quasi-classical flow. This is also very interesting. Um, if one generate the turbulent flow by some mechanical means, for instance, you tow a grid through your superfluid helium, or use rotating object in liquid helium to you know, generate a flow. In that case, the accumulating evidence suggesting that when flows are generated by mechanical forcing, the two fluid can get strongly coupled and behave pretty much like a single fluid. And then there's a viscosity coming from the normal fluid, and also you know, at a small scale, there could be some mutual friction damping. So in the end, the two fluids just simply cover the gate and behave like pretty much a classical fluid. So this is why we have the name quasi-classical flow. The interesting point is, if one can generate a quasi-classical flow, probably you know, it could be useful for classical turbulence research because 
you know, the kinematic viscosity of uh, helium-2 is so small, you can probably generate a very high Reynolds number for those. Again, there are questions. For instance, as uh, uh, Demos, uh, you know, talking about, um, some recent simulations suggest that probably the vorticity field are not very well matched. So there are still, you know, some discussions. And furthermore, um, at very small scales, say at scales below mean body plane spacing, we know that the two fluid cannot match together. In that case, there will be additional dissipation due to mutual friction. And there are some uh, theoretical uh, study which suggests that due to this uh, dissipation at a small scale, the intermittency could be quite different from that in classical fluids. Um, so the question is, can we <laughs> develop some measurement tools to start with us. Another temperature region that is very interesting is at a very low temperature, uh, say below about 0.6K uh, for heating form, when there's no normal fluid component. In this case, we have just a pure, you know, what uh, superfluid with a uh, what extent. In this case, there's still uh, experimental evidence suggesting that large scale turbulence can still be generated even in pure superfluid. And then an interesting question one can ask is, how does such a large scale turbulence decay? Because so there's no viscous damping, and there's no dissipation, viscous dissipation. So the phys physical picture there is, we may have a large scale vortex loops. Those large loops can break up into smaller loops by reconnection or some other processes. And then the energy can be transferred from large scale to smaller scale. This is essentially a Richardson cascade. And then when the energy is transferred to mean vortex line spacing, this scale, then the, except at the vortex reconnection can excite uh, Kelvin waves. Those Kelvin waves can further cascade energy down to even smaller scales. Eventually, those energy will be dissipated as you know, thermal excitation, uh, phonon emission. Um, this is definitely a very interesting, very beautiful physical picture, but uh, there's still you know, very limited experimental evidence. I think more recently, the Finland group produced some uh, direct, uh, experiment like this. Um, it would be very helpful if one can directly visualize quantized divorces at a very low temperature in pure superfluid. That will help to solve a lot of the puzzles. For instance, one, one puzzle is, okay, um, we say there could be large scale flows. Well, those large scale flows, how are they generated? There must be what the bundles as in the color uh, suggested. But uh, can we see those bundles? Furthermore, there's a, there's a transition from large-scale hydrodynamic turbulence to wave turbulence at small scales. So um, could there be a, a bottleneck for energy transfer? Can energy freely transfer from one type of turbulence to the other type of turbulence? And also some other things. So um, I hope through this uh, brief introduction, um, I convinced you that it's interesting to start a hydrodynamic series of what we for. Actually, uh, if one can develop quantitative measurement tools, um, we can probably have better understanding of the hydrodynamics, which may benefit various uh, scientific and engineering fields. Okay, in the past, there are some <coughs> flow visualization techniques developed for helium form. Um, one such technique is based on the use of micron-sized trace particles. And um, this technique is called particle imaging velocimetry. Um, my colleague, Steve Vanskyber, and his team um, did a lot of pioneering work in this field. They used uh, particle imaging velocimetry. Um, in typical experiment, uh, the trace particle could be polymer microspheres <coughs> or solidified hydrogen particles. Later, this um, method of using solidified hydrogen particles was adopted by many other labs because uh, you know, the particles produced this way have a better uh, density match with the fluid. So how to produce those particles? Simple, they just make a mixture of hydrogen gas with uh, helium gas, and then inject the gas from room temperature directly into the cold fluid. And then the hydrogen gas will condense and form solid particles Typically, the size of the particle will be several, several microns in diameter. And then one can send in a laser sheet to illuminate those particles. One can then take two images at short separation time. So based on the displacement of those particles from one frame to the next, 
one can then map out the completed velocity field. This is a definitely a very useful technique. And they applied it to start at various flows in superfluid helium. Sometimes, well, originally, their whole class, the particles were just traced the viscous normal component because the supercomponent has no viscosity. But they find that in some cases, the particles do not always trace the viscous normal flow. They suspect that probably the trace particles also interact with quantizing vortices. That was confirmed later in the so called particle tracking velocimetry um, experiment. A group at the Maryland University, led by, by Dan Nasro, together with uh, Shirini from Uni uh, New York University, um, they conducted the particle tracking velocimetry measurement in the for the first time. Um, so essentially, they used the same particles, hydrogen uh, isotope ions. What they did is instead of taking two images, they just simply take a movie. Surprisingly, they find that in the superfluid phase, besides those particles, you know, move with the viscous normal component, they also see line structures. Quickly, they realize that those line structures are essentially due to particles trapped on the forces. <coughs> so this method is indeed very interesting because it provides us the opportunity to directly observe vortex dynamics. What's the size of those particles? Several microns in the radius. So this is significantly larger than vortex. Significantly larger, yeah. And also the coherent matter. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, how are you sure you trace a vortex and not several of them? Or something like that. So seems like I think it's well, um, I can show you some evidence later because uh, in you some see, cases you like, see, you see like they, they look like, but how do you know it's that, not something else? Well, um, you can check some of their papers. They they, they started those what is called reconnection events. No, and the the dynamics, yeah, 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 I, I know, know. but the, the dynamics fit, can be fit very well by single line reconnection. They did numerical simulation as well. But you are right, in some, in some of the data, you can easily see uh, they probably have you know, very large clusters, and then the multiple lines can attach to a single single What's the separation, inter inter optics in the separation? I don't know. You need to so ask it, is it bigger or smaller than the size of the particle? It's typically bigger. I, I think this is a very good point, actually. What he actually is saying. Yeah, well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, then <coughs> this technique quickly spread <coughs> to a number of labs all over the world, including our lab, the Dix lab, and some other labs. <coughs> so here I'm going to uh, briefly talk about our contributions in recent years. We applied this method to study both thermal counter flow and the quasi classical uh, turbulence generated by moving fluid. So this is the experimental setup we used to start a thermal counter flow. There's a flow channel immersed in liquid helium with a controlled temperature. And then there's a heater at the bottom of the, uh, of the channel. We turn on the heater, there's a counter flow. Normal fluid moves up. We can inject the particles and then start the hot particles move around. So here's the movie. You can see that definitely there are some particles that move upward probably with the viscous normal component. But besides that, there are also some particles wandering around. And on average, they can move down. Okay? This is very typical and it has been observed by a number of labs. So we can do more quantitative analysis. For instance, we can analyze the distribution of the particle velocity in the heat flux direction, streamwise direction. If you do that, then you will find some peak structures like this. At low heat flux, you observe two peaks. This red peak, we call it G2 peak, um, is centered around the expected normal fluid velocity. Upward. Upward, yeah. And then the blue peak, we call it a G1 peak, is centered close to the expected superfluid velocity. But as you increase the heat flux, these two peaks merge together, and then this blue peak will shift towards positive velocity, you know, moving upward. Go ahead. Sorry. But it seems so it's centered on negative value, the G1. G1, yes. To begin with, at a very small heat flux, the mean velocity agrees quite well with the expected superfluid velocity. Okay. It seems very close to zero. Um, we do have the observations. It has to be a little bit better. 
No, no, fine. That's why I'm okay, we can, we can delay discussions. Yeah. All right, then as you further increase the current, you see that eventually you only have one single peak. If you check the tracked profile of those two types of particles, you can easily see for the red G2 peak, those tracks are straight outward. And then for the G1 particles, their track are irregular and on average they can even move downward. And then as you increase the heat flux, you can see that those red tracks, those G2 particles, their track lengths become smaller, and you can also see switching from one type to another. Now we have a good understanding of the underlying physics. The G2 peak are essentially due to particles not trapped on contact vortices to begin with. Those G1 particles are trapped on contact vortices. Okay? So the G2, G2 uh, uh, particles, they need to move through the vortex tangent, but there are certain mean free paths for the particles to move through the vortex tangent. At low heat flux, the vortex length density is small, so they have larger mean free paths to go through the vortex tangle. This is why we see longer track lengths. As we increase the heat flux, the density of the vortices increases, and then the mean free paths of the particles, untrapped particles, to go through the vortices, the vortex tangle becomes shorter. So this is why you start to see shorter you know, G2 tracks. And also you start to see transition from one type to another. And then at sufficiently high heat flux, those particles trapped on vortices, they can be actually pulled off contact of vortices by the viscous track from the normal component. So essentially all the particles simply undergo frequent you know, trapping and detrap. As a consequence, there's no difference between the two. Because why don't you cut the flow? You still have counter flow. I mean, normal fluid still moves downward, and moves upward, and superfluid moves downward. It's but just that the drag know. force from the viscous normal flow is so large, all the particles are simply pulled out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think D Demos uh, has a lot of calculation on this. Absolutely. It, it agrees very well with the physical picture. Yeah. The history. Okay. Yeah. All right. So based on this physical picture, then uh, well, there are a lot of uh, more stuff so we can dig out, especially in the low heat flux region, where we observe the two separated peaks. One thing is, for instance, if you take a look at the track of those untrapped particles, uh, the G2 particles, <coughs> they just simply move through the vortex tangle. As I said, their track lengths are probably correlated with the mean free paths through the contest of vortex tangle. So we adopt a very simple formula to correlate the track lengths with the vortex length density. So by analyzing the track lengths of those G2 particles, we can estimate how large is the vortex length density. Surprisingly, this gives us a vortex line density, agrees very well with the measured vortex line density using second sum. So the message is, PTV not only allows us to produce those nice you know, particle tracks, it can also allow us to measure vortex line density in kind of low, at low heat flux. Then if you started the tracks of those travel particles, the G1 particles, they have velocity fluctuation obviously. What we find is that this velocity fluctuation is very homogeneous. Along the stream west direction, perpendicular to the stream west direction, the fluctuation amplitude uh, is essentially the same. But this can be understood because those are traveled particles. So at least when the heat flux is not very high, this motion is to a large extent caused by the motion of the you know, vortex lines in the vortex tangle. So, roughly, yeah. So then you, one can uh, uh, use some existing formula that describes the average motion of those uh, contact forces. It turns out that uh, the observed particle velocity fluctuation can be very well described by uh, those simple models. So really, their velocity fluctuation is caused by vortex motion, at least at relatively low heat flux. But if you started the velocity fluctuation for those uh, untrapped particles, G2 particles, the situation is very different. Even when normal fluid is lambda, we still observe very strong velocity fluctuation in the heat flux direction, but essentially nothing in the other direction. This was a big puzzle to begin with for us. But uh, yesterday, as you already learned from Joe's talk, this can be explained uh, uh, by means of the drag effect you know, in the normal fluid due to complex forces. So I think now we have more or less a good understanding of that. 
Um, we also applied this PDV technique to study the uh, so-called grid turbulence. So my student fabricated a very nice uh, flow facility as a flow channel. You put a, a grid in it, and you can control the grid speed. We also have second sum transducer installed, and we can inject trace particles to do flow visualization. And the point of using grid is because, in general, people believe that um, the turbulence generated behind a grid is more or less homogeneous and, and, and isotropic. So it's simple. The measurement can be compared more directly with theoretical bridges. So um, here is a typical movie. You can see that after the grid is taut, definitely those trace particles move around. Uh, there's a turbulence. But the behavior of the trace particles is quite different uh, than counterflow because here you see most of the tracks are relatively smooth. There's no zigzag motion like you observed in the, in the counter flow. All right, so um, we are conducting some quantitative analysis, but uh, it's slow because my student graduated. He got a good job offer and decided to, la to leave the lab, the, the lab. So we are training new students, but gradually we are, we are producing a some result. What I wanted to show you is um, this. At late, at late decay times, we observe a lot of uh, vortex events. Um, so those particles travel on individual vortex line, and you can see two vortex lines approach each other, uh, undergo reconnection, and this reconnection can generate Kelvin waves. So we can see that this reconnection, and then some waves generated like this. Um, this is definitely not new because the Maryland group already reported that. So what's the difference? What distinguishes us from the Maryland work? Um, if you check the recent publications, you will see that all the results were obtained in some early experiment conducted at temperature uh, above 1.9K. Why? Because they don't have large enough cooling power. They have a relatively uh, small pump. And um, the vortices are produced um, not really by any flow. It's essentially uh, remnant vortices after the phase transition. So they only have 13 useful reconnection events. All the analysis are based on the 13 events. What we can do, fortunately, my colleague, again, my colleague, Stephen Skyber, he actually built up a very strong pump with a large blower. We can actually pump a large killing mass all the way down to about 1.1 K. So we can do this type of measurement in a wide temperature range. This is very unique, I would say, because not uh, many labs has uh, this capability. So essentially, we can tune the normal fluid fraction all the way from 100% to nearly zero. Furthermore, we have a very well controlled method to generate fluid, generate fluids. So we have a lot of more, you know, Data and better statistics. This is an ongoing work. We want to just study the vortex dynamics uh, in a more systematic way. All right, so I showed you that PTV technique is very useful, uh, especially for studying complex vortex dynamics, but there are some known issues. For instance, the particles produced by injecting the, hot, the gas mixture um, has a wide size distribution, although nowadays I think we can uh, very well control this and uh, um, we have a size distribution of uh, several, several microns. But still, I mean, some particles are non spherical their behavior could be complicated. Furthermore, there's a heat load for sure, you know, accompanying the injection of the gas. So this technique can hardly be applicable at a very low temperature, say below 1K, nearly impossible. What's more problematic is this method are not applicable in some cases. For instance, for counterflow at high heat current when both fluids are turbulent. Then in that case, as I showed, those particles simply you know, undergo frequent trapping and trapping. There's, no, there's essentially no way to analyze the motion. So we need a new technique. And another method we developed in our lab is based on the use of very small molecular traces. Those traces are so-called map-stable heating molecules. For two ground-state heating atoms, when they meet together, they will not form a molecular state. This is because essentially the interaction potential is repulsive. They tend to stay away from each other. 
But if one atom is excited to a high electronic state, then the interaction potential with the ground state helium atom will change. There's a potential minimum at around one angstrom. They tend to stay together and form a mass stable molecule. Depending on the outshell electron spin, the molecule could form in a singlet state or triplet state. Singlet molecule will quickly decay in a few nanoseconds, but the triplet molecules, their decay requires a spin growth, which is forbidden, strongly forbidden. So their lifetime is very long, it's been measured to be about 13 seconds. So those particles can be used as trace particles. Furthermore, they can be easily produced in liquid helium, as long as they're there's ionization or excitation in liquid helium, then molecules will be formed automatically. So one can use radioactive source or sharp constant needle field emission, or even laser field emission if you have strong enough laser. What's more important is that their behavior is relatively simple in superfluid helium. Above 1K, one can easily show that the Stokes uh, drag from the normal component essentially dominates any other forces. So those molecular traces were simply being trained by the viscous normal force. And then several years ago, we conducted an experiment at Manchester. At a very low temperature, those molecules can bind to complex forces when there's no more component. So that means at an extremely low temperature, in principle, we should be able to visualize the complex forces using those molecules. Why did you say it was the mechanism? Uh, it's just you know, the binding energy. I mean, the, there's a balloon force pushing the particle towards the vortex core. You put the particle on the vortex core, it actually display you know, uh, uh, some fluid, and those fluid has large kinetic energy. Is this little bubble comes to be spherical? Or? In the ground state, in the triplet ground state, it's more or less spherical. Okay. All right, how to visualize those molecules? Um, there was a laser-induced fluorescence technique developed at Yale in my uh, postdoc advisor school. <clears throat> Essentially, one can uh, use a laser light at a 9 or 5 nanometer to excite the molecules in the trip from the triple the ground state to the excited D state. From there, the molecules will decay to an intermediate state by emitting red photons, fluorescence photons, and then quench back to the ground state, the triple the ground state. So one can drive the second transition many, many times to get a lot of photons out of each individual molecule. We test this method, and indeed, we can see the molecules, and those molecules do follow the normal fluid motion. More recently, um, at Florida, um, we developed a very powerful molecular tagging velocity technique. So the concept is we focus a femtosecond laser, pass it through the regime, and then in the focal center, in the focal region, the laser field is strong enough to ionize or excite helium ions. As a consequence, a lot of molecules can be produced along the laser. So this way, we can actually write a trace line in superfluid helium. We tested that, and indeed, we can create a trace line, and we can easily control the thickness and the length of the trace line. Although in our past study, we, we normally create a trace line with a length of, uh, of about one centimeter, a thickness of about uh, 100 microns. But in principle, we can get it down to 10 microns, the thickness. Then if we allow the tracer line, straight the tracer line to move together with the normal fluid for some certain drift time, they drift and distort. So based on the displacement, we can then calculate the local normal fluid velocity. This turns out to be a very useful technique. We first applied it to start a thermal counter flow. So in this flow channel, we turn on the heater and then write a trace line and then stop, uh, observe how the trace line moves around. When there's no heat flux, we simply see a straight trace line. It decays with its uh, radiative uh, lifetime. And then at very low heat flux, we see a straight trace line deforms into a more or less parabolic shape, which indicate laminar flow. And then at a slightly higher heat flux, we see this so-called tail flattened uh, laminar flow profile. At the even higher heat flux, then we start to see a random deformation of the trace line, which suggests terminal flow in the normal flow. So um, this tail flattened profile does not exist in classical channel flow, so it generated a lot of interest in recent years. So there are a number of uh, numerical simulations, including the one recently conducted by Makoto's group. Now we 
more or less understand that the mutual friction can affect the normal fluid velocity drop. And then in the turbulent flow region, we can uh, calculate the local velocity, uh, uh, local velocity of the normal component. Plot is uh, distribution, probability distribution, <coughs> and then uh, start is say uh, turbulence intensity. We can also correlate the velocities and then calculate the velocity correlation structure functions. So in recent years, there are a lot of uh, uh, work done in characterizing the uh, normal fluid turbulence in the flow. And most of this work are in collaboration with colleagues in this field, including Joe and uh, Victor, Nadik, and some other people. I also wanted to very briefly mention that we also applied this technique to study grid turbulence in, uh, in, in Hemi 2. This was uh, that by a recent student from Ladik School. I have no time to discuss the data, but the message is uh, we confirmed that uh, in homogeneous isotropic turbulence in Hemi 2, intermittency, there is an intermittency, intermittency enhancement in good agreement with uh, theoretical prediction by Victor and, uh, and his colleague. So here I'd like to say a few more words about uh, more recent application of this method. We applied this method to study um, some practical problems for the accelerator community. So nowadays, many particle accelerators utilize the so-called superconducting RF cavities to accelerate particles. Those RF cavities are cooled by superfluid here. And the one critical parameter in, in, in this field is the so-called maximum accelerated field of the cavity. Well, this maximum accelerating field uh, is limited by cavity quenching caused by heating from very small defects on the cavity's inner surface. When that occurs, the energy stored in the cavity quickly turns into heat, and then this heat transferred into superfluid heating and then generate second sun. There's a long-standing effort in this field trying to develop accurate, reliable methods to locate those surface defects. And the one very popular method used in this community, almost every accelerator lab, is the so-called second sound triangulation method. They put detectors, second sound detectors, at different locations, detect the second sound signal, and triangulate the location of the hotspot. But there is a mystery in this field for over one decade. That is, in order for the signal to converge, they need to assume a second sound speed higher than the known speed. It's not, uh, it's not known what, what the reason is. Um, that actually compromised the reliability of this method. So we wanted to help with our visualization, flow visualization. And the concept is very simple. If there's a hotspot, we we'll create a trace line nearby, and then uh, based on the relative position, the straight trace line will deform into a different shape. So based on this shape deformation, we may be able to figure out the location of the hotspot. We did a proof of concept experiment. So we used a very small resistor uh, to simulate the hotspot. We pulse it on, put a tracer line nearby, trying to see whether there's any resolvable deformation. It turns out that we can see clearly the deformation, the line deformation. And based on that, we, can, we develop a model to calculate the location of the hotspot. And surprisingly, we can uh, uh, determine the hotspot location within a few hundred microns. This resolution is far better than any existing method. So um, furthermore, besides this, we also solved the puzzle of second sound triangulation, but I have no time to discuss the details. This work will appear uh, in physical review applied. Um, obviously, the funding agency, DOE, is quite happy about this work. They're going to support us to develop this uh, 3D imaging capability so we can do hotspot uh, detection on 2D surface. Okay, let me quickly go through the rest of the uh, slide. Ongoing work, one of the ongoing work uh, is the, what I call it, universal healing pipe flow. Um, we have a very nice facility, again, uh, fabricated by my colleague, Steve Manskyer, who retired a few years ago. So this is a, essentially a horizontal press plate. It has a flow pipe inside. This pipe has a lens of about five meters. It's very long to avoid the you know, entrance lens effect. There, there are two liquid healing baths, and the one can use a barrel pump to push the liquid to flow from one side to the other. There are also optical windows. One can also put heater there to drive counterflow, 
or mixture of both. So essentially, the, you can generate whatever type of uh, flows you want with this uh, facility. Um, however, in the last operation, about six years ago, it was damaged. And since then, we just put it in the uh, storage space and uh, just leave it for, for years. Recently, I decided to restore this facility and get it set up with our laser facility. Um, so the first experiment, which is supported by uh, NSF, um, is to start a high Reynolds number pipe flow. Why are we interested in that? You know that for classical fluid flowing through a pipe, there's a very famous wall of the wall, which says that away from, a little bit away from the wall, uh, the velocity profile can be described very well by a log, log law profile. And uh, in the dimensionless uh, 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 form, this log law can be observed at a dimensionless length scale of, uh, above 600. I think with our trace line, we, our resolution can reach something like 30, so we should be able to resolve uh, this log law profile. And what we plan to do is to create two trace lines perpendicular to the channel surface, and then by observing the deformation of this two trace line, we can not only study this log law profile, and we can also do uh, longitudinal and transverse velocity correlation measurement in pipe flow. What's the significance of, uh, significance of it? Indeed, this is a, an interesting question one can ask is, what do you expect about the law of law, you know, in hitting to pipe flow? Think about it. The, soup, the normal component has zero velocity on the, on the, on the surface of the wall, but the super component can move freely on the, on, on the wall surface. So that means there's a probably a mutual friction between the two components near the wall. How does that mutual friction change this log law profile? I don't know. And I searched the literature, it seems that there's no answer, as far as I know. So it seems that there's a, this is an interesting topic. And furthermore, it's not just an uh, interesting theoretical topic. It has practical significance because nowadays, engineers at MagLab and other accelerator labs, they are considering to use pipe flow, forced pipe flow, hit into pipe flow to cool their magnet and accelerators. And then this log law profile will matter because it's uh, related to friction factor, pressure drop, and many other things. So that's why we wanted to start it. Excuse me, how close to the wall you can measure uh, velocity in, uh, yeah, in that, the wall you yeah, I, I yeah, I know you were asked so much to why pull this one line here. Our resolution can reach uh, 30 you know, dimensionless unit. This is essentially the uh, uh, resolution divided by the viscous scale. Mm -hmm. So we can resolve down to a 30. Mm -hmm. And then if you check the classical log law uh, profile, the log law profile uh, appears at about uh, 600. So we should be able to you know, resolve the, the, the whole range. And the uh, buffer layer also. Pardon? Buffer layer also you can study in detail. Um, yeah. Well, we'll try. I don't know. I mean, it also depends on the quality of the trace line near the wall. That's something I don't know at the moment. So uh, in the past the summer, we set up this optical system. It's actually quite tricky because at the MAGLA, if we wanted to send our strong camera cycle laser into the air, pass it across the optic table to the flow channel, it, it's prohibited. And a lot of you know, safety concerns, but eventually we were successful with getting this done. And uh, my student also designed this uh, setup to split the thermal second laser beam and put one of the beam on a translation stage. So now we can create two trace lines and we can tune the separation of those two trace lines uh, with a tune range from zero all the way to one centimeter. So that should be sufficient. I hope that we will conduct some experiment very soon. Okay. Um, uh, several more slides for this uh, uh, vortex line imaging uh, project. Um, so we wanted to visualize quantized vortices at a very low temperature, but as I already mentioned, those molecular traces will attach to quantized vortices only below about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 K. I don't have a dilution refrigerator, so I must think about something else. And the way I, uh, the method I come up with is to use a specially designed superconducting magnet to levitate a drop of lubricating. And then if you pump out the vapor, this isolated drop can be easily pumped down to below 0.5 K. 
And then if you dope it with those trace particles, trace particles will attach to quantized vortices, and then there's a chance to visualize the vortices. What's the motivation? Actually, to me, the, um, uh, uh, the main motivation is to study the drop dynamics and the morphology. We wanted to rotate the drop and study what will happen uh, to this rotated drop. Because for classical drop, it's well known for viscous drop and go solid body rotation. We know that uh, some log shape can develop when the rotational uh, speed is high. But what will happen to a superfluid drop when there's no vortices? The superfluid inside will not undergo solid body rotation. It's, a, it's essentially a, 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 a government uh, potential flow. Potential flow. <laughs> yeah. And then when there are vortices, the vortices may also affect the uh, stability or forage of the drop. Uh, what's interesting is uh, recent, recently there's a group uh, led by uh, Andre uh, Bolasov. They started the morphology of highly rotating, rapidly rotating nano droplet of superfluid heat. They showed that when those droplets undergo fast rotation, the shape is still extra symmetrical. So it's a bigger puzzle. And then... Uh, uh, it's the same in nuclear, by the way. <laughs> and then uh, such a system could link to other uh, physical systems. Um, I don't know what, what kind of useful information we can produce. But anyway, uh, to lactate a drop, essentially you need a magnetic field. And this magnetic field has to be non-uniform. And uh, this is because uh, the helium is a diamagnetic material. If you put it in a non-uniform magnetic field, there's uh, essentially a gradient force. When this gradient force is strong enough, you can lactate a drop. This has been done and demonstrated by a group at the Brown University. This is essentially my PhD advisor's group. So I got this uh, nice cryostate from that group <coughs> years ago. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's not been in use for quite a quite long time. It's uh, damaged, such and such. We recently uh, restored it and successfully charged it up to 160 amps, which is sufficient for drone adaptation. So next step is to put a liquid heating cell there and then uh, the, uh, transfer some liquid heat into the center of this trap and see what will happen. As I say, if you just pump out the vapor, you can easily cool down the drop temperature to below about 25K you know, in, in a few tenths of a millisecond. So uh, we don't need dilution refrigerator. And furthermore, the drop uh, radius will only decrease by a few percent. So we will have a large drop trapped at the center of the, of the magnet. And then if you ask how to generate the voices, um, well, there are many different ways. If you rapidly cool the drop, there is a phase transition. So Kibbutz working mechanism probably will produce a lot of uh, random vortices in the drop. Furthermore, when you cool the drop, there is a radial counterflow. This counterflow can also generate uh, vortices. Um, another method is uh, something you know, developed in the cold atom field. Uh, one can use a time-bearing BS field, magnetic field, to rotate the drop. And then in this way, you can uh, generate what is this in a more controllable way? Okay, I stop here for questions. Can you show us the page of a particle blocking in the sum of quantum field? Yes. This one, yes. Yeah. This one. So, did you find some difference between the central part and the near the walls? Because uh, there are two reasons. One is uh, you know the normal fluid velocity is different from the central part of the near the wall. The, the other is the MOSFET is more different. The numerical simulation of both our group and Andre Bauer's group show the both is denser near the walls than the central part. So you can find some difference between them. Uh, Joe asked the same question uh, a while ago, and we did check this. Um, <coughs> I can tell you um, the, the result is not included. I can tell you um, we did observe fairly flat velocity profile near the center, closer to your simulation result. Mm -hmm. And then the velocity actually drops a little bit near the wall, but does not drop too much, does not drop all the way down to zero. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we still need to understand that. Uh, 
We perform this experiment. We can confirm the flows to the wall density with respect to height. Yeah. You can do that if you change uh, the. Uh, actually, what you do, you change the <coughs> length square if you uh, observe the particles. And then, I mean, you uh, calculate the plot phase, uh, let the plot phase depart from number three, then the distance between the rest of the space. And you can show it's smaller close to the wall than the bulk of the sun. Uh, any other questions? Well, could you comment on the use of um, submicron fluorescent particles? Because that's was started by in the in the Maryland group, but does not seem to have been taken up. Um, I actually chatted with them last week about this several times because uh, they initiated this method. I think their problem is um, there's no very good way to inject a lot of fluorescent nanoparticles into the into the liquid, so they only have very limited number of traces in the viewers. As a consequence, what they are trying to do right now is uh, put several cameras to track the motion of individual fluorescence nanoparticles in 3D. But they cannot decorate the same vortex line with a lot of the trace particles. So we need a good way to inject those fluorescence nanoparticles. Uh, in my opinion, I think the vibrating transducer is probably the best way. The method of hydrography is. Could I ask another question which is slightly related to it? And that is, what are the prospects of seeing individual uh, eczema molecules? Well, that's a good question. We never try to push this, but if you ask uh, uh, Dan McKinsey, he will say it should be possible. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Stupid question. Maybe yeah. not, not only from you, but also from logic. If, if you take a contact flow with the two uh, um, um, pipe tube. With what? Uh, the pipe tube. Open pipe. Open pipe. Open pipe. Open pipe. Yeah. Open pipe. Yeah. Open half of it. You mean with a super leak? You mean proud to two? He means proud to tube. Ah, uh, Peter tube. Tube. Oh, tube. Peter tube. Peter tube. Or two Peter tube open in a uh, open in, in opposite direction. Uh -huh. What? And you will have two different measurements, <coughs> probably. So, can you, is it possible to separate the uh, mean at velocity of normal superfluid component I see. in the geometry? Well, we, we never uh, tried to do that, but uh, this is something I suggested to uh, Philippe. <coughs> they may have experience on this uh, in a small sense. I think it's better for, the, for, for that group to work on. Yeah, you really encourage. Any other question? A quick one. Wait, do one? these trace of liquids like well in the one or in the even gas as well? Yeah, in healing gas, yes. Uh, some of the images I showed actually are produced in healing gas, if you, if you take a look. So I, I know why you ask. Um, this the question was, do the tracer particles also work in helium gas? Yeah. Um, those actually produce in helium vapor. So they, they should be, uh, this technique should be useful for convection research in helium gas as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker. Right. Thank you.